Calling all sledgeheads, calling all sledgeheads. This is a call to arms to any of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show fans who live in or will be around the New York City area this weekend. Head on out to Jamaica, Queens, to the NYC Arena and get yourself a ticket to the most important show that I think I have ever been privileged to be a part of. This Saturday, November the 16th, in the memory of Matt Travis, the House of Glory superstar whose life was tragically taken this past weekend in an accident in the Bronx and has shook House of Glory to its core, but we are going to stand together as the family that we are and we are going to put on the show that we intended to put on and we are going to do it to make Matt Travis proud and I hope that you guys who are able to will come out and have a good time with us and celebrate his life Kurt Angle will be there. Mick Foley will be there. I'm going to be there as well. Don't be afraid to come out and say hello if you are in attendance. I would love to see the Sledgehead Army in full force to support a brother of mine in House of Glory. Private Party and Proud and Powerful are going to have a tribute match of their own next week on AEW Dynamite. And our tribute is this Saturday. And I hope to see each and every one of you there as we gather together to say goodbye as a family and and give him the show and the and the going out that he truly deserves a life taken from us way too soon in the memory of Matt Travis hope to see you guys there Hey, yo, Wham! What is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. AEW's Full Gear was this past weekend, and they followed it up with a fallout show with tonight's episode of AEW Dynamite, which was a whole lot of fun. There was a lot of things going in the right direction. I like a lot of the things that they decided to do with the stories that were coming out of the pay-per-view, but... As with any professional wrestling show that we watch on this channel, there is always some things that we could nitpick. Some of you say, oh, you nitpick, but it's not always just nitpicking. It's just the way that I feel, and I see some things that could be deemed as wrong. That's the title of this show, and what could possibly be wrong? What could be wrong with my perfect little wrestling show? Stick around and find out. My name is Nick Nightmare, and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. Everything wrong with AEW Dynamite Review and Reaction Show. Really not much wrong, but we're going to talk about it. Let's do it. AEW Dynamite was exactly that tonight. We were introduced to the real and the absolutely amazing MJF. We have got a couple of matches set up for next week that I'm already super excited about to tune into. And they did almost everything right on tonight's episode of AEW Dynamite. Now, the first thing that sticks out like a sore, 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 sore thumb is the fact that this show was not timed correctly. I don't know what segments went long. I don't know if they're just having a hard time, you know, trimming out the show. But that last matchup was only given 10 minutes for the main event, and it was threatening to maybe go over. They tease the fact that, oh, if we go over, we're going to give you the action on the AEW page on YouTube. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's going to be a disaster, as literally... Hundreds of thousands of people are now going to be tuning to one page to watch this thing on the internet. If you, if you think the Disney Plus crash was something, wait till you see what would happen when that shit went down. Because everybody was invested and tuned into the end of that matchup and wanted to see how it was going to end. And I feel like it ended a little bit abruptly. I want to shit all over the main event just because... The champion of AEW took a pinfall. I'm going to say that about every single time a champion takes a pinfall in a match where he shouldn't be losing. You got Sammy Guevara in the match. Why did Chris Jericho have to take the pin? I've been the hardest critic on Jericho. I've been talking shit about his body. I've been talking shit about his in-ring skills. I've been talking shit about his age. 
But I got to give props to Chris Jericho. This man has been on every single show. He's pretty much been wrestling every single time we see him. He's done more for AEW in the last three months than, than a Brock Lesnar has done in the last three years. So you got to give props to Chris Jericho, if for nothing else, for his tenacity to keep performing and keep being the figurehead and really trying to live up to the moniker of being Le Champion. You got to give props to him for that. So why does he get his first loss against SCU? Scorpio Sky pins the world heavyweight champion of AEW in the main event. Why? Why? Especially when Sammy is there. I understand you want to give SCU a nice little spotlight here, but they just won the World Tag Team Champions. Was the championships? Is it absolutely necessary for them to have been pinning Chris Jericho? That's a poop hammer like decision, if you ask me. Definitely in the realm of possibilities, just based off of the booking. Why? Would you, I mean, especially coming off of what he just did to Cody Rhodes, coming off the tremendous promo segment earlier in the night, Chris Jericho is cementing his legacy as the hottest property in AEW, and you tarnished it tonight. For what? For what? And I'm sure somebody out there is going to be like, No, David, it's AEW. <laughs> because you guys like to shit all over me when I like to point out what's wrong with AEW. I don't know what's... So different about an AEW fan as opposed to a WWE fan. I, I cover WWE. Nobody threatens me or nobody talks to me in a negative way. And I know it's because we all are in agreement that that show is a piece of trash. But there's no reason why we can't have cordial discord talking about AEW Dynamite. AEW is the type of company that wants to give you a guy like a Marco Stunt. And want you to buy in and believe in... And I'm not allowed to say anything bad about it. AEW is the kind of company that wants to give you a death match way before it should be happening. And I'm not allowed to criticize it. AEW is allowed to give you a Nyla Rose, but I'm not allowed to question it. I'm not allowed to feel uncomfortable with it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I don't understand it. I don't understand the double standard. Why can I talk shit and, and shit all over the WWE, but the minute I say anything bad about AEW, the thumb down, start raining down like hammers, and it's just, why? Why can't I have my opinion, and you have your opinion, and we can agree to disagree? I don't say anything wrong about anybody. I'm not coming off as offensive. I'm not being derogatory when I speak about Nyla Rose in specifics, which we will discuss tonight. It's not coming from a place of hate. It's not coming from a place of of defamation and I hate her. In fact, it's it's quite I'm indifferent to her. I don't like her per se, but I don't dislike her. I have no reason for either of those things. So I I'm she's just kind of there for me and I get confused and I feel weird watching her. Why is that not okay? I'm sure some of you guys can relate. Maybe some of you guys can't. Some of you are going to feel like I'm a fucking asshole just for saying that. But what did I say so wrong? I just don't see it the way you might. And there's nothing wrong with that. With that in mind, I want all of you who haven't already probably thumbs me down just for that to keep an open mind as we go forward with the rest of this Dynamite review. And let's do that. Before I do say something that I might regret or that you will misconstrue, which you totally will, because you always do on Wednesday nights when we talk about dynamite and you just get on my ass because I don't love everything about your show, your precious little AEW. He doesn't appreciate Kenny Omega. I appreciate everything Kenny Omega did. I appreciate everything Dean Ambrose did. John Moxley did. I just don't think this was the time for that. How did it escalate to that level just because John Moxley said so? Oh, he pushed Kenny Omega off a stack of chips at double or nothing, and, and John Moxley said he was going to do all these things. So that makes it okay. Where's the hatred? Where's the real reason for them to want to sever each other's fingers from hands? Where's the real reason for them to want to end each other's life? Because I don't like you? Oh, I don't like you. You're from that other place. I don't like you. You wrestle in Japan. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have had the match at all. 
saying they shouldn't have had the match. Now, whether or not I like it is a whole nother topic for a whole nother discussion. And I talk about this now because AEW Dynamite opened up with Kenny Omega. And he had a video package and he was talking to a doctor backstage. And he was not cleared to compete this week. But Kenny Omega was curious to see if the same was true for John Moxley. And that was not the case as per this doctor. Moxley had been cleared for competition. And why Kenny Omega wouldn't know this being that Moxley was going to be in the opening matchup. Or, I don't know, if it was maybe previously filmed? I don't know. I, I, it felt like that was happening in real time. But it could have been filmed earlier today. Maybe I missed it. I don't know. All I know is it felt kind of weird. Him finding out, just finding out that Moxley was cleared. And then we start the show with a cleared Moxley. Defeating Michael Nakazawa in a total squash match. Which took up barely any time. Moxley wins with the paradigm shift. And cut a very good promo following this and he said he's many things but he's not a liar everything he promised would happen at full gear came absolutely true he says he has respect for Kenny Omega now and he will never ever be the same again he was respectful that Kenny Omega had the balls to stand up to him unlike anybody else in AEW or probably anywhere else He said he's on a mission to be the last man standing in AEW, which seems pretty threatening and seems pretty badass, and I'm into this promo. He delivered it very well. And then he delivered an open challenge. If anybody in the locker room wants to step up and face him, make sure to kiss your loved ones goodbye and have an ambulance ready on speed dial. This was a great promo. This definitely set the tone for Moxley going forward. It fits with everything we just seen him do just a few days ago. And I enjoyed it. All right, everybody, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because I'm not watching a massacre happening before my eyes with no real basis for masochistic tendencies to be portrayed in that matchup. And if you don't understand what I just said, man, go pick up a book because those words weren't even that big. But I feel like it did sound a little, little pompous. Like I'm not trying to sound smart. It's just the way it came out. Anyway, now we move on to the Dark Order, which I absolutely hate. I hate everything about them. I still don't know anything about them. They're sitting out here, and they're having a match with the Jungle Express Light. (laughs) The Jurassic Express Light. What the hell did I call them? The Caveman School Bus or whatever I call (laughs) I forgot what it was. The Stone Age School Bus. Some shit like that. Marco Stunt and Jungle Boy, they get handed an a easy L here to the Dark Order. It wasn't about this match. It wasn't about Jungle Boy. I'm not even going to talk shit about Marco Stunt because this was not about any of them. This whole match was simply to do one thing, and it was to bring back the Luchasaurus, which made me totally hype because I love him as a performer. I think his look is great. I think he's unique. I think he's going to be a big star in AEW with or without his little running buddies. And I'm a big fan of the Luchasaurus. But like I said, this whole entire matchup was just about his return. The Jungle Boy and Marco Stunt combination would lose to the Dark Order. And then Stu, Stu Beans, Stu Grayson, or whatever you want to call him, He makes the offer to Marco Stunt to join the Dark Order. And I'm like, yeah, he looks like he could be one of the creepers. Put a little mask on him. He'll be a little inconsequential. Maybe I'll actually care a little bit more about him if he's part of this and not so much part of the Jurassic Express. But this would come to nothing as, like I said, Luchasaurus comes out, beats up all the creepers, Dark Order backs away, and they celebrate in the ring after Luchasaurus hits Stu Grayson with a choke slam and a standing moonsault. They are, he is back. They are ready to go. The Jurassic Express ready to take the train to the next station. That was a terrible segue. I'm exhausted, by the way, but that's no excuse. I'm sitting here and we're doing this and we're doing this together. We had a triple threat matchup. Darby Allen defeated Sean Spears and Peter Avalon. I can't stand Peter Avalon and Leva Bates. 
I'd hate the whole librarian gimmick. Every time they open their mouth, I want to fall asleep. Just their mere presence on AEW makes me feel like I'm watching a WWE product, and I cannot stand any single thing about them. I do love Sean Spears with Tully Blanchard. I think that's a great pairing. And I'm a big fan of Darby Allen. I think he's next level. I think he's going to be a great, great superstar. He's young. He's got some crazy ideas. He does some crazy stuff. Some of the stuff I don't agree too much with, but he's tremendously entertaining. Darby Allen gets the win in this triple threat. Another thing about this matchup, much like the previous matchup, was that it wasn't so much about the triple threat. It was about what would happen after the matchup and during the finish. As Joey Janela would come down to try to get some vengeance on Sean Spears for everything that happened at Full Gear. And they would be taken away from ringside, which freed everything up for Darby Allen to get the win by dropping the coffin on Peter Avalon and gets the easy win at that point. But then he picks up the microphone and with four little words says something that makes me want to tune in next week without question. He says, John Moxley, I accept. And I am excited. And I've seen the graphic towards the end of the show and I'm looking at John Moxley and I'm looking at Darby Allen, And I'm going, man, I feel like I'm watching that movie Looper. There's just something about Darby Allen that I feel like there's just this. He's got that same aura that Moxley had before he was WWE. I, he's just got that real similar presence and that crazy mindset. This is going to be a kick-ass match. There's no gimmicks to it. There's no extreme element to it. It's going to be a wrestling match between two completely insane individuals. And I'm into it. And I can't wait to see it next week. Nyla Rose defeats Danny Jordan. I have no... I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say because... I just want you guys to understand. Like I said, I don't dislike Nyla Rose. I don't perhaps like... Nyla Rose. I respect everything about her. I give her credit for doing what she had to do to match her insides to her outsides. It's it's something that is happening all over the world. You know, it, it's in celebrities. You got Bruce Jenner. Like, the, this whole... This is a thing, and, and it's fine. And I really don't have an opinion on it one way or the other. And I don't even actually mind that she's a wrestler, but I just want you guys... To understand something. When I'm looking, what I'm seeing is a man without his genitals beating up a woman. And I'm not supposed to say these things, I guess. I, I'm not, that's not a derogatory statement. That's a scientific fact. Those are, that's a fact. That is a fact. I, I'm not talking down about it. I just, I'm bringing the discussion to the table. Like, this is what we're watching. I'm not going to believe that any more than anything else. Why can't we say that? Why can't I feel uncomfortable about it? I'm sure you guys are going to hate me for it. But I don't care. I can't be dishonest with you guys. It's how I feel. I don't feel negative about it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just don't understand it, I guess. And maybe that makes me narrow-minded. Maybe that makes me sexist or right, whatever the hell you want to call me. It definitely doesn't. Because I accept all people and all their colors and shapes and sizes and lifestyles. I don't care what she does in her private time. I just want to make sure we understand what we're actually watching here. Let's move past it. They announced the AEW Dynamite Dozen Battle Royal, which is going to happen on next week's show as well. So I'm excited for this. A new match concept. We got 12 competitors where it's going to whittle down to the last two. And the final two will be competing in a singles matchup the following week. And the winner is going to receive a beautiful diamond ring of some sort. I'm not sure why the diamond ring thing is the reward and not like a shot at the championship or does the diamond ring come with a shot at a certain championship? Is this going to be connected to the new supposedly 
in the works title that is coming for the mid card. We'll have to wait and see. It's definitely got me interested. Tony Schiavone left the broadcast position to interview Ali. Ali started to say she's showing the world what she's got on AEW Dark, which is a show that I don't even waste my time with. And then the lights went out. AEW likes to drop the lights out. And I will say this again, and I will say it every week. They decide to do the Lights Out gimmick two to three times in one show. That should be done once a show for one star, and that's it. Figure out who it is. I don't care that Brandy Rhodes and Cody Rhodes are married. I don't care. It's two completely different entities, right? She's trying to get away from what Cody Rhodes is doing. So do your own entrance. Don't drop the Lights Out. And then debut Kong. I don't get it. That aside, Awesome Kong shows up with Brandy Rhodes. She's wearing a piece of hair from B. Priestley last week. That piece of hair she chopped off. So what do you think she's here to do this week? She's here to chop off a piece of hair from Allie. Apparently, she's collecting hair samples now. I don't know if Brandy Rhodes is going to start cloning people. Is she going to use the hair samples to try to create the most perfect genetic wrestling female ever? I don't know. Is she going to make a necklace out of it? Are they going to weave it into a blanket? Are they going to make a snack bag out of it for, for Kong? Uh, what, what's with this? It's interesting. It's different. It kind of feels a little bit like where I think the WWE was going with her with the whole karma thing. If you remember, they had those video packages where she was removing Barbie doll's heads and she was cutting the hair off of other ones. That notwithstanding, this was okay. This was okay. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Nothing on this night made me happier than the next segment, which was Chris Jericho and MJF in a dueling promo segment, which was absolutely unbelievable. Chris Jericho came out on his own, touting his bullshit about he's still le champion. He demanded a thank you from everybody in the locker room and every employee in AEW. But then, the lights go out. And we are made to believe that Cody Rhodes, who was said to not be at the taping tonight, or at the show tonight, rather, was revealed to be MJF. Walking to the ring with Cody's music playing, Cody's Titan Tron playing. It was very, very dickish to do, and it was great. He said to the champion... We'll talk in a minute, but he had to get some things off his chest. The crowd just tore him up, and he ate it up like it was delicious, man. It was so great to finally see MJF in his true element, messing with the crowd. He knows they don't like him, and he don't care. He wants to tell them that the the villain in this story is not MJF, but it is Cody Rhodes, and you've been cheering him the whole time. He's claiming Cody Rhodes is selfish. He's claiming Cody Rhodes took him under his wing only to hold him down underneath his thumb. This was a very fiery and very passionate promo from MJF. And the crowd just soaked it up. And they just played their part and they booed him as loudly as they could. After this whole tirade, he says what we are looking at now is the new face of AEW. He then turned to address Chris Jericho. He said he's actually a really big fan. He heard a rumor that Chris Jericho wanted him to join the Inner Circle. And then Chris Jericho said, well, I heard a rumor that MJF wants to join the Inner Circle. And this went on for quite some time. And while normally I might be upset with the repetitive nature of a certain segment, this was friggin' great! This was great. It was like watching Bugs and Daffy going at it in a, in a classic Warner Brothers cartoon or like Laurel and Hardy in the Who's On First thing if you're old enough like me to know what the hell that even means. It was great. It was a great back and forth between two wrestling villains and they did a whole lot of comedy with it. Jericho's, my best, my favorite line, the best line he said was MJF is a lot like him. He feels like he might even really want to be Chris Jericho. It's almost like MJF's parents got horny while watching Chris Jericho beat up Juventud Guerrera on WCW Saturday night 25 years ago, and then nine months later, your little twerp ass came out. That was the line of the year. 
I don't think I laughed that hard at anybody's line on any show in all of wrestling in all of 2019, and Chris Jericho got me. That was fantastic. It was so great. But then they wanted to talk about who the biggest jackass in AEW was. It seemed like they were both going to say each other, but they wanted to say it at the same time. They counted to three, and they said that the biggest jackass in AEW is Cody Rhodes, which then made Cody Rhodes show up at ringside, and he pushed his way through a couple of stupid security guards who were trying to stop him, ran to the ring, immediately attacked MJF. He tried and failed and botched terribly on a first attempt at a power slam on Chris Jericho. And I'm going to give him forgiveness because did you see him almost die on Saturday? So I am not at all going to fault Cody Rhodes for that spot. And if you do, then you're a fucking ass bag because the man, did you see the lacerations on his face? He was concussed. He probably shouldn't have been out there, but he's, he's the boss. Who's going to stop him? Nobody, and he's trying to put over his friend. He's trying to make everything better. I'm sure maybe his injuries were exaggerated so that we could believe that it was worse than it actually is and he could actually be part of the segment, but who knows? Who knows? What he put his body through on Saturday dictates that he shouldn't even be able to do a power slam at all, and he didn't the first time, but he did pull it off a second time around. He went once again to attack... Um, I'm sorry, I'm just saying he, I'm speaking (laughs) stupid. As Cody went to face with MJF once again, all of a sudden Wardlow enters. Wardlow, the AEW answer to Walter, I'm thinking, and he laid out Cody with a John Cena-like attitude adjustment, then proceeded to try to choke him out. The referees ran down to try to save Cody, and then he was helped to the back during a commercial break with MJF just screaming into the camera and the one thing that never was truly settled is did MJF join the inner circle? I'm thinking no. I'm thinking that that was just a tease that they hugged it out like a couple of bros. They had a bro moment like a couple of smart friends that I have on Twitter were saying as we were discussing this. And we're going to move on. And MJF and Wardlow are going to be a thing going forward. And then Chris Jericho and the Inner Circle will be their thing doing their thing going go their own way. And I'm alright with that either way. Pac defeated Hangman Page in the rubber match of their series. And this was a freaking great match. Every time these two guys touch, we have a fantastic wrestling match. This might have been my favorite match of the three so far. It was a little bit short, I think. Could have been given a lot more time. Felt maybe a bit rushed to me, but that's also because, like I started out saying, I think I started out saying, this is like the third time I did this friggin' review, so I hope I said this at the beginning, but if not, I feel like the timing of this show, overall, more than anything, time issues were evident throughout this show, and I think it struck here as well. We cut to the back, and it was great to hear JR and Tony Schiavone saying these classic phrases, like, there's something going on in the back, let's cut to the back, and the camera's in the back. We got something going on. And it was a tag team brawl. The Young Bucks and Santana and Ortiz, proud and powerful, were just going at it throughout the backstage, beating the snot out of each other. There was one instance where they kicked down a bathroom door and everybody's favorite breakfast drink man, Orange Juice Cassidy, was standing there doing nothing, as always, which is fine. The crowd gave a big pop. I still don't care. I might learn to care at one point, but I just don't. He's got to show me. I don't know what some of you might know. I'm not familiar with him other than AEW. And right now, his gimmick to me is garbage. It's garbage, and I hate it. And I think it's a disservice to wrestling. But I need to see him do actual wrestling. And then, until then, the jury is still out. This brawl got bigger than just those two tag teams. We seen Brandon Cutler come out to make the save for the Bucks. But he got immediately shut down. Private Party came out. Santana and Ortiz finally backed off. And then they announced next week's matchup. Proud and Powerful versus Private Party. For next week, this thing really, really just was 
off the chain in a good way. This is what the WWE tries to do, but fails because they overbook it to a point where it's nonsensical. And here, everything moved, everything flowed from one section to the other. We had the insertion of other faces. We had the power bomb off of the the uh, the announced stage. It was great. It was great. And it puts everything in a forward projecting motion. We want to see Santana and Ortiz versus the Bucks again. Private Party and, San- and Santana and Ortiz are fighting next week. So now we have a reason for, to look forward to that even more. And the only thing I could say might have been wrong with any of this is that this is what they have all of the actual tag teams doing. And then in the main event World Tag Team title match, we have the makeshift duo of La Champion and Sammy Guevara taking on the AEW champions, which seems a little bit wrong to me, but I will give it forgiveness because the whole backstage segment right here was fantastic, and the AEW tag team title match, I did not enjoy so much. There's something about Sammy Guevara that doesn't appeal to me. I love SCU, but we already pointed out at the start of the show the fact that Chris Jericho's shoulders have been pinned to the mat in AEW is absolutely something wrong with this show. And I don't know if it is just based off of the time thing. Maybe they had no choice. I don't believe that was actually the ending and the way that they were supposed to script it. I think maybe Jericho had no choice but to call an audible because they were going off the air and the referee told them, you guys got two minutes and they had to go home. And this was the best maybe way they found to go home. Because why... The other reason that I didn't like it is why would a guy like Scorpio Sky be able to kick out of a code breaker when coming down off the top rope? That seems a little bit much to me. I don't know, especially when it's being done by the company's champion. And maybe he should have just won that match. And, but but you don't want to give him all the championships, right? You don't want to take it away from SCU. They just got it. You don't want to do that type of WWE bullshit just yet. But why not give it? Give the loss, really, and have the shoulders of Sammy Guevara pinned. Why do you have to have your champions losing against somebody he's not even in a program coming up with in the future, to my knowledge? It just seemed kind of out of control, and just all of a sudden, it was over. Jake Hager made an impact here and there. Looked a couple of times as if Jericho and Guevara were going to actually win this. But thankfully they didn't. I just don't like the way they went about the end of the matchup. Pinning your champion is among one of the worst things you can do to your champion. Whether you're a woman's champion, a tag team champion, an intercontinental champion, a world heavyweight champion, or any champion in between. Once that strap is on your waist, the only time you should be pinned is the time that you lose that belt. There's no excuse for it otherwise. You're making your champions look weak that way. Plus, Chris Jericho was in control and he got pinned by a simple schoolboy. A 49-year-old veteran got pinned by a schoolboy roll-up. That type of shit baffles me, man. Absolutely baffles me. This was well put together. The action was okay. There really wasn't a lot going on, but what did happen, most importantly, the whole MJF Jericho thing, was the whole reason to watch AEW tonight. I might even be being overly nice to it just because I'm afraid of the backlash that I'm going to get from you dynamite heads who don't like to hear what I have to say and want me to just suck dick. I don't do that. Not since that last time. (laughs) But all kidding aside, listen. If you cannot be a human being and you cannot have a discussion about these things without getting angry and without wanting to kill me or wish wish death upon me in some way, then you need to seek therapy. Because it's not a healthy frame of mind. I'm a human being with feelings just like you and I want to hear your feelings. You're entitled to your feelings, but you're not entitled to tell me to drop dead. So if that's your point and that's what you're going to bring to the table, leave that shit somewhere else. Take it to some other channel that enjoys that type of filth because this is not one of those channels. And all you will find yourself is now blocked and you will be invisible so that you do not infect the rest of my sledgeheads 
with your intolerable nonsense. And don't you dare come at me and tell me I'm the intolerable one. Because I'm not. I love everybody. Like Rocky Balboa. You know what I'm saying? Thank you guys so much. That's your AEW Dynamite review for this November the... What the hell date is it? 13th, 2019. I, I'm exhausted. And I'm nervous about AEW reviews now. I know anybody watching at this point are, are just my sledgeheads who are with me. If you hated me, you're fucking gone a whole half an hour ago, most likely. I just don't get it, guys. I don't understand why in this day and age people's opinions just don't matter. I mean, my opinion isn't going to hurt nobody. It's just my opinion. Even if I was being negative and derogatory, what does it matter? It's just fucking words from one stupid guy on the internet. Why is it <laughs> driving such hate? You can't talk about AEW, man. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to wrestling, man. Calm the fuck down, people. Holy shit. Three years we've been doing this. We've been building this family. We've been covering wrestling for over three years. Never once until last weekend have I been attacked the way that we were attacked. And it's all thanks to AEW. I don't get it. Like this video if you want to. You can thumbs down it too. Why not? Join the club. Everybody wanted to thumbs down the full gear review because they didn't like that. I didn't love that little Kenny Omega match. <laughs> Kenny. <laughs> Get out of here with that shit. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'm delirious now. It's almost 1230 in the morning. I got to shut this down now or I'm not going to get this to you guys by 1. And I hope to have this up by at least 1 a.m. So I can go to fuck to sleep and we can do all this again tomorrow. And maybe start talking about NXT again if it's worth it. If NXT is not worth talking about, don't even expect it. And we will resume our regularly scheduled programming on Friday night when SmackDown decides to shit all over us. And if you don't want to miss anything coming forward, if you enjoyed this review, if you've joined the Sledgehead family, thank you. If you haven't, hit that subscribe button right now and become one of the over 2,000 plus that know when you want to have fun, have logical discussions, and be a decent human being while talking about things that may be a little bit edgy and may be a little bit touchy and personal, Sledgehammer TV is the place to be because we accept everybody's lifestyle, we accept everybody's opinions, and we accept everybody's shares and likes and comments and hope that I see all of your comments and opinions down in that comment section below, which, as you know, is yours. My name, everybody, is Nick Nightmare. This is the team, Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. His tag team partner, the world heavyweight champion of all the microphones in all the world, the most in <laughs> Mr. Blue, the snowball microphone, the most important member of the team, as always, is each and every one of you. Thank you, guys. Let's wrap this shit up. That's going to do it, and we are out of here, and then we will see you next time, right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. Boom. Uh -huh.